All right, now we're joined by John Roderick, who's running for City Council position 8. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Hi, my name's John Roderick. I've lived in Seattle for 25 years. I was born in Seattle and grew up in Anchorage, but have lived here at, for 25 of the last 25 years. Uh, I'm a musician and an artist, a lifelong Democrat, and I'm running for position 8 on the Seattle City Council, which is one of the at-large positions. I am... Uh, Sort of, this is the first time I've ever run for public office, and one of the first questions people ask is, "Why are you running, and why, uh, why take on such a lofty role, or take a take such a big job, a big bite out of the apple?" Um, and I, I sit on the Seattle Music Commission, and have been working uh, to try and reintroduce art education into the Seattle City Schools, and for the entirety of my time in Seattle, I've been. I have initially felt like the music and arts community in the city was really uh, treated very hostily by local government. And then as time went on, we've been more and more embraced and have found our voice in the city. And that has energized me as a citizen, and I feel like I can, I can perform a, 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 a kind of a new role in, in, uh, in joining the city government, which is to reintroduce the idea that arts and culture are a pillar of our civilization and not just a window dressing to be thought of as a, an afterthought. I'm also a, a, you know, a fully fledged member of the city, so excited to enjoy this process. Great, so now we have our four uh, prepared questions. They're actually right in front of you if you want to turn them over and read along as we read them out loud. Uh, these are two minute answers, I think. Actually, Maria, would you start with number sure. one? Start with Seattle one. is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, and rent control, among others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? You know, it's a, it, our approach to affordability has to be holistic, and traditionally we've tried to play whack-a-mole politics with, mm -hmm. uh, with you know, a lot of issues in the city. And, you know, all of these uh, approaches to housing affordability are fascinating and some of them have more problems than others. I think the city has a, 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 an opportunity and a responsibility to actually build and provide housing, not just for the poor, but affordable housing for middle class families and people throughout the, you know, the income sphere to live in the city. As a musician, I feel like my own community is kind of a, a canary in the coal mine in the city. I see musicians and artists being priced out of living in the center of the town. <coughs> And we're losing our our cultural and our intellectual heritage by this affordability problem. So I'm excited about the city taking responsibility for building housing, and I'm excited about all the different approaches to, you know, taking control of the rents. Okay, Mary, number two. Okay, Seattle is the fastest growing city. No, it's number four. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Last year, voters approved a levy to fund a universal preschool pilot program. After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program, and what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? Well, right, the big problem is that there aren't enough preschools and enough spots in preschools. I have a four-year-old daughter, and we've been struggling to find a place for her in preschools. So. There are a lot, I mean, we, we need to fund so many programs in the city, and uh, there are incredible opportunities that we're only just beginning to explore. There's no, uh, there's no reason we can't impose a capital gains tax in Seattle to fund these programs. There's no reason, we have a 1% for art program that, uh, that takes 1% of big development and puts, puts it into lobby art. There's no reason these big developments downtown can't also have a 1% for housing or 2% for housing and 2% for, uh, for education. I think if the city is, gets into the business of building housing, that's a great opportunity to also build preschools in those new city-built communities um, to, to provide a kind of, again, a holistic approach to affordability for people of all walks of life in the city. So the the ability that the city has to fund these projects is one of the major issues uh, of, in this kind of wide scope push we're making, this progressive push that's going to happen in the next 10 or 15 years. And the opportunity to explore different 
funding options and public-private partnerships and, and uh, including things like preschools and hard education in every project is a, it's a great, it's an exciting time. Great. Uh, Sean, will you read number three? Sure. Bertha is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront, transit, and an unsafe viaduct? Well, the viaduct needs to come down. It should have come down a long time ago. The Bertha um, is going to be a great skate park and maybe mushroom farm uh, at some point <laughs> in uh, the near future. My sense of, uh, of Bertha is that it's a classic example of, you know, that tunnel was a 20th century solution to a 20th century uh, transportation problem. And we're in the 21st century now, and we need 21st century solutions to mm -hmm. what are going to be 21st century transportation problems. Um, the waterfront is, the, is, the, is a key component of the city, and, and the waterfront redevelopment can be an opportunity for us to show our best face and build, uh, build the, the beautiful commons park that, we, um, that the city deserves, right? But uh, it isn't going to happen if it's a, um, a superhighway. We saw in San Francisco when the uh, Embarcadero Freeway fell in the earthquake, there was all kinds of hair pulling about how uh, they needed to rebuild it or traffic was going to go crazy, and they didn't. And instead, the Embarcadero is now the gem in the crown of San Francisco. Transit is the, is the big issue uh, for accessibility, for equitability in the city. It's a social justice issue. It is the, it's uh, our opportunity to build the city that we foresee uh, 20 to 50 years from now to make it just as easy to get from Ballard to, uh, to West Seattle as it is to get from Linwood to Federal Way. And uh, we've spent a lot of time building transit out to the suburbs, and now it's time to build a citywide transit system. Clayton, number four. Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth? And what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the you know, the growth is coming, and it, 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 this is a this is, we have an intellectual capital here. Mm -hmm. People love the city. Uh, my own arts community is routinely used as a enticement uh, mm -hmm. when they're recruiting software designers from Cupertino. Come to Seattle. There's a great arts community, uh, and then that those imports are pricing the arts community out of the center of town. Um, I think that. Seattle has to adopt a different way and a different approach to market capitalism. There's a Wall Street model where the businesses are beholden only to their shareholders. And there's a Cupertino or San Francisco model which just says, you know, growth is good in every form. And Seattle has to have a different model. And that model has to say that our corporate citizens are, have, a, have a, 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 an expectation of citizenship. And they need to recognize that they are putting a burden on the city by their growth. And you know, they're bringing fantastic wealth here, but also making it very difficult for pe middle class people to live. And they have an additional responsibility to help fund transit and housing, to help participate in the process of keeping Seattle affordable. For 150 years, you could be a working class person and live in any neighborhood in Seattle, with the exception of Madison Park and the Highlands. Now, in the last five years, you can't be a working class person and, and live in a lot of neighborhoods in Seattle, and that's, uh, that's changing fast. And I don't believe that that's inevitable, and I don't believe that we have to accept the rationale that the market is the only church in American public life. There, uh, there, are, there are other way stations between pure capitalism and revolutionary Marxism. Somewhere in between is where we should <laughs> try and find <laughs> the Seattle way. All right, so now we'll open it up to follow up questions. These are one minute answers. A lot of them, I, I've got one. I've got, uh, hold on, let me try it down. Okay, so I um, asked this of uh, all challengers to incumbents, and I have for years. So you're running against an incumbent. No one is entitled to any particular election, but is there a particular reason why you believe Tim Burgess should no longer be on the city council? 
Well, as I said to Tim when, we, when he asked me out to coffee, uh, I, that I wasn't running against Tim Burgess uh, as much as I was running for the position eight on the Seattle City Council. The redistricting is bringing in tremendous diversity in all the districts, and that changes the nature of the at-large job. Um, the argument uh, that we need some continuity, we need, the, uh, we need a member of the old guard to shepherd in this new cast of city council people, I think is a, is a flawed argument. The council is going to be a very different <coughs> organization, and it's going to have a lot of different voices on it. And now is the time for progressive change. Uh, the, we, we have to make a 15, a 20, a 25 year plan. And that requires that we be thinking that far ahead. And there are a lot of, uh, a lot of old faces on the council that aren't going to find it a very familiar environment. Uh, and so there are a lot of new voices being heard. And we need to have people on that council that are learning the ropes so that they can be the old voices 15 years, 20 years from now, who were there in, at the time of the sort of the big leap forward toward a more progressive city. Thank you. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, let's talk about, the, uh, about Aurora Avenue North from the north end of the Aurora Bridge to Shoreline as an art project, how would you see it defined as an art project? Aurora Boulevard as an art project? Yeah. Wow. It's a fantastic art project. Uh, you know, the, the, what are its elements? The, well, the, de the decrepit uh, motel stock that was, uh, that 15 years ago really uh, characterized Aurora Avenue North, a lot of them have been torn down and some of them are falling into the ground. Those are, I think, great resources, not just because they're beautiful examples of mid-century modern architecture, but they're also, like, could potentially be transitional housing, like they, the, the, the role that they performed for <coughs> decades. Uh, you know, one of the things we talk about when we talk about housing, one of the things we forget is that for years and years, people lived uh, in single-room occupancy hotels. Uh, and, there, and we still have those facilities all around. But, uh, as we look at Aurora and the unchecked way it has evolved over the, se the, the several decades, um, it is a, it's a patchwork quilt of everything. You, know, you, can, you can read the story of the 20th century, just crossing over the Aurora Bridge and looking at the things that remain. That old Sambo's restaurant is still there. And if you can imagine a time where there was a restaurant named Sambo's, where the mascot was a little boy in a turban riding an elephant, some of his counterfeit. Right. I, I still have one. I, I still have one of the coffee cups. Right. Uh, but so, I think we're out of time on that question. <laughs> it's a fascinating question. No well, one's ever asked me one. We'll, we'll get to work on that art project. Okay. That's about yeah, seventy yeah. blocks long. So uh, Elizabeth and then Joseph. So what ideas or policies um, are you thinking about in terms of making Seattle well climate kind of change issues? What can Seattle do to mitigate and to assist in limiting this? So Seattle needs to be the test case city for America and, and ultimately for the world. And typically, there is a kind of, uh, of lip service liberalism uh, that happens here where you know, people do the, the minimum required to continue to call themselves sort of liberal activist people. But we're at the cusp of it. Tremendous shift in technology, where obviously transit and density are going to help Seattle become a less polluting, more <clears throat> ecological city. But there's a, a you know we're about to see a time when solar power, I mean solar power right now has parity with coal for cost effectability, and that's only going to that's going to increase you know exponentially in the in the coming years. There's going to be a city in America that builds the first municipal scale liquid salt battery to harness solar power during the day and then dispense it at night. There will be a first American city to build it, and it should be Seattle. That we should not aspire to be a carbon neutral city. We should aspire to be a carbon sink and, and, and initiate those technologies, and other cities will see that we can do it profitably, and we can do it uh, with, you know, with grace and alacrity, and they will follow our lead. People are already watching Seattle around the world, and we need to be the thought leaders. Joseph, David, and I have one. And Anthony, too. Mm -hmm. 
what art bills would you introduce in your first year? And what, you know, down the road, if you could sort of carve a city out of marble that is your ideal art vision for Seattle, what would that look like? And how would those bills advance that vision? You know, the, the great thing about the Seattle arts community is that they really don't need any help. They just need to not be, you know, to be actively opposed, right? What we need in Seattle is art education. Um, uh, the fact that we don't have universal arts education in our schools for all grades in all neighborhoods is uh, an unconscionable sort of crime. We've lost the idea that arts are a pillar of citizenship and civilization. And to, to teach math and science and not teach art is to do our kids a disservice. As an artist on the city council, I'm well aware of what artists want, which is for people to get out of their way and to be able to live in the city. They don't, arts, artists do not all want to live in artist housing. A lot of them want to live in warehouses. And they want to live in, they want to live in the center of town and make their art. Uh, and they don't need help. They need the, they need the freedom to work a part-time job and concentrate on making art, which is their real uh, vocation. So they are the test case for affordability. We need the city to be affordable, and that's the number one thing to do. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, you, you mentioned uh, when you introduced yourself uh, that you're a musician, an artist, and a Democrat. And I've got some uh, relative idea of the pay scale of being a Democrat. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm wondering if you might uh, uh, describe a little bit about your music and your art. I love talking about it. When I first started in the music business here, it was the model was still that you got signed by a record label in California and they gave you a million dollars and then you wore a feather boa and never had to work again. <laughs> <laughs> that model changed dramatically uh, when I was first starting in the music business and my first record came out on a Seattle uh, independent label. And the label and I worked and worked hard to build a community. Um, and that included a, a dozen Seattle bands. And it was a very you know, fruitful time. Um, but for most of my music career, I was living hand to mouth. Um, and saw many times, uh, you know, was handed an envelope that had half the money I was promised. And got home from a tour and paid all my bandmates and had uh, really nothing left over. And then in the late 2000s, I got a phone call from uh, Hollywood. And they said, we're going to use one of your songs in Nino Beverly Hills 90210. Is that all right? And I said, uh, uh, I guess. And, uh, and then I made a down payment on the house. <laughs> <laughs> so I continue to make a living uh, because checks come in the mail from my music, primarily being used in the entertainment business. Um, and, and then I make $200, $500, $700 dollars at a time playing live concerts. So, um, You're a guitar player? I'm a guitar player and a singer and a songwriter. I feel like I should ask about your feather ball. <laughs> and I, so we have, for, we have, have a feather ball. We have time for one more question. I'll skip myself and Mary. Go ahead and do your question. Go ahead and do yours, because I've got oh. so, uh, and it's not coherent. <laughs> On selection of Seattle is collecting signatures for Initiative 122, which would establish a public financing program with vouchers uh, to voters. Uh, have you signed the petition? Do you support it? And how do you think it would change elections in Seattle? I have, I have signed it. I do support it. And my mother is collecting signatures on behalf of it. <laughs> um, and you know, I'm in a, I'm in a race against a, a very well-funded and established opponent. And the thing that is, uh, and that's a, it's an enormous challenge to raise the money even to be considered competitive. Um, I think that the, the financing of public elections nationwide is a, is a disgrace. And uh, this, is a, this is another example of Seattle trying to establish a different way um, that, is, uh, that should be a role model uh, nationwide. And, and it's, a, it's an exciting experiment. We're conducting a lot of exciting experiments in Seattle right now. 
and we don't know how they're all going to play out, but boy, they are exciting, and, it, and, and this is a great time to be a citizen here. And so, yeah, I support it all the way with every, with, with my actual muscles and calluses. <laughs> well, we're about out of time, if you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. Um, I know that, I, that I'm, you know, I'm a, a newcomer to the local political process, and I'm meeting people who have, who have been active in politics for many years, and act, you know, really active. And uh, I understand that, the, that there's a temptation to see me as an outsider. But I'm not an outsider, and I've been active my whole life. And, uh, from the standpoint of an artist and a musician, I was always in, in the position of playing the benefit show for narrow, playing the benefit show for, uh, for you know, homeless kids. And now I'm on the other side of that line. And I'm meeting a lot, there's a lot of Venn diagrams of people I already know. And now I'm meeting them in a new light. But I'm not, a, a, uh, I'm not from outside our city and our culture. I'm, uh, I'm a representative of it nationwide and internationally as a as a musician and as a, as a podcaster, um, and now I'm I'm enjoying, or I'm you know I'm I'm putting my hat in the ring as a as a citizen uh, and a Democrat. Great, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.